Hello, everybody in the Second Shift community, and thank you for joining us today. We're in a, it's May, and it is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage and Awareness Month. And this, we are doing an, a fantastic panel discussion this morning with some badass women who we have picked out for their very specific knowledge and um, viewpoint around how to be an ally in this moment specifically concerning women in the workforce and ways in which we want to learn about anti-bias and standing up for those who are our coworkers and our friends and our family. So this is interesting for me because today I'm passing over the reins to Michelle Pei, who is the head of product for Second Shift and a valued uh, talent and coworker and friend who is also Korean American and feels very strongly about this topic. So we're gonna have Michelle ask all the questions, um, but I wanna introduce our panel first and foremost and say this is being recorded. This will live on our website afterwards. So if you have to log off or you wanna send this around to other people afterwards, please feel free. We'll make sure that it goes out to everyone um, through our social channels. So welcome to our webinar on AAPI heritage and allyship. I'm joined by Esther Pang, who is a board member of Hollaback, which is an organization that's ending harassment by transforming culture and building safe environments. I think it's such a cool group and the way that they're tackling this topic is so interesting. And um, I've always wanted to learn how you, how you best stand up for people in, in the correct and proper way. So it's, so you are part of the solution instead of actually being part of the problem. And Michelle Pei, who I said was gonna be taking over, she's our head of product here at Second Shift for years and is just an amazing talent. She's also our COO and I just adore Michelle. So thank you for doing this, Michelle. Sung Young Chai Morrow, who is the executive director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, and they're fighting for policy and cultural change for AAPI women and girls, so obviously very relevant to our community, community. and Angela Garbies, who is a working parent advocate and writer. She also has an amazing podcast called The Double Shift, and she wrote a book called Like a Mother, and if you were reading earlier um, in the pandemic about a lot of working women and how the pandemic has affected working women. She wrote an amazing piece um, in New York Magazine and I just thought it was you know, super moving. She is somebody that I've been following her career for a long time and it really lines up so well with the way we talk about advocating and parenthood and working women. So with that, Michelle, I'm gonna let you take over and run this. I'm gonna sit here and if people have questions at the end of this conversation, put any questions in the q and I'll ask them and then, we'll, um, and then we'll be able to address them later. Thanks, Jenny. That's such a nice intro. Um, so I'm also super excited to um, be on this panel with these amazing people. Um, I'm Korean American. I was born in the 70s in a mostly white community. And my parents immigrated here from Korea in the 50s and 60s. And so it was all about assimilation. Assimilation was going to be acceptance. Um, and, you know, I think I really saw myself as white because I didn't see any other Asian people around. And you know, obviously the home life and the school life were very different. And I learned to code switch at a pretty young age. And then that just continued in my professional career. So, you know, I think I faced a lot of stereotypes about the overachieving Asian. And, um, you know, there were times when just my being Asian was not acknowledged as at all, like as a person of color. Um, and so, you know, I think <clears throat> as I progressed in my career and started to understand, you know, what is my place here, I was also um, conflicted about, you know, what is my place relative to other people in other minority groups? I came from a fairly privileged background in terms of my education and, um, you know, my, my parents. And so, you know, I just didn't understand, like, how do I fit? 
how do I advocate for myself as, as well as for other people and other uh, minority groups? And so I'm really here to learn from this group. I think I still have a lot to learn here. Um, I don't think that my experience is particularly, particularly unique just talking with family and friends. And so, you know, I think um, selfishly, I'm just glad to be part of this panel so I can learn from these three amazing people about, you know, how we can create better work environments, both for ourselves as Asian women and then how we advocate um, for others as well. Um, so, Song Yun, I guess you're the you're up first. Um, can you just talk to us about like what is the current state of the Asian American woman in the workplace? It's just a small, just a small topic. What's the current state, and how did we get here? Yeah, yeah. So, um, there are a couple of things I want to talk about specifically, um, just you know, in the context of what what we're experiencing in the pandemic, but also more broadly work that NAPOF has been doing. So at NAPOF, you know, one of our focus areas is actually economic justice. As those of us on this panel know, maybe not all of our viewers, but, you know, the model minority myth, this idea that Asian Americans are the quote unquote model minority has really invisibilized um, those in our community that don't fit that stereotype, right? Like to your point, Michelle, many of us have grown up more privileged and much more sheltered and went to went to colleges and have you know decent jobs but but our community is really diverse we come from 50 different countries of origin many of us come from for various reasons everything from you know having to leave a war torn country to just wanting to be reunited with family to uh, pursuing you know different opportunities in life. And so when you have such a broad community that's all swept up in this one category called the Asian American Pacific Islander, and because the population is so small, our, our data gets aggregated, which means that we all look like we're doing much better. And when you actually pull, pull the data apart, you find that there are those of us in our community that really are very disadvantaged. And so one of the one of the work one area of work we do is around gender wage gap, right? As you know, many of you may be familiar with that. Surprise, surprise! Women still don't make what men make in this country, and really, the standard that um, we compare to is what a, a, an average of what a white man makes in a year, right? And so we have what's called a equal pay day, which is a year and however month and days it takes for that woman to make what a average white man made the previous year, right? And so this year, for example, the national equal pay day fell in March, right? So um, it takes, it, women make about 79 cents to a white man's dollar. So when, when a white man is making a dollar, women in general are making 79 cents. Well, the aggregated data for Asian Americans say that we, we actually make 89 cents to a white man's dollar. So, so our equal pay day falls in February. But what that invisibilizes is the fact that five of the ethnic minority groups um, with the widest wage gap are actually Asian American, right? So you're talking about Hmong Americans, Burmese Americans, Nepalese Americans, who, who actually make 51 cents to a white man's dollar, yet they're lumped with this other group, this the broader group at making 89 cents to a white man's dollar because there are, you know, folks who over-index, right? They're making a dollar 10, a dollar 12. And so that really invisibilizes the, the most vulnerable in our community, right? And so when I talk about this, people are like, oh, I never thought about that. And, and then to, to the second point on that, um, especially in the pandemic, um, the National Women's Law Center put out some research that says that Asian American women have the highest long-term unemployment rate of any ethnic group, any racial group. Uh, that is being um, unemployed for more than six months. So of the people that are unemployed in the Asian American population, Asian American women, we have the highest ratio of us being longest term unemployed for more than six months, right? And people are like, is it because y'all are quitting jobs and staying home with your kids? I get, a, I get asked that by reporters. I was like, well, that could be, but I also, like, if you think about it, like when you go eat out, if you eat, at an rest, ethnic restaurant, who's serving you? It's Asian women. You know, if you go get your nails done. It's, so it's like the service sector that completely got shut down by the pandemic. So it's really because of that, that Asian Americans, Asian American women have such long, high, long-term unemployment rate. 
And until I say that, many people are like, oh, I never thought about Asian American women being in low wage service sector jobs. And then they think about it and they're like, yeah, you're right. Like, so it's like, we're, we're completely invisible in this, you know, in, in America, we have this bad habit of invisibilizing people that are in the service sector period. And I think because of the model minority myth that somehow all Asian American and Asian American women are lawyers, doctors, and engineers, that we don't work in the service sector jobs, right? And so, so that's, you know, that that's that's one aspect of it. The other piece is just around the safety, right? That there are many of us who feel unsafe because of the increase in violence and harassment. Um, women are are three three to four times more likely to be harassed in public by a stranger, Asian American women are, than Asian American men, right? And so, in fact, when we were doing surveys of our staff about coming back to work, people were more concerned about taking public transit to the office than about catching the coronavirus. And that being the reason why they wanted to work remotely. That's how serious this is. And this is something I hear from a lot of people that are having to commute to work, that they actually worry more about their safety than catching the virus. Wow, I um, thank you for that. That's a lot of really surprising. If I, I count me among the people who are surprised by those stats. Um, and so is the this longer than six months unemployment, is that is that COVID specific or is did that exist pre COVID? Yeah, that that's that's um well COVID as in from the beginning of the year, right? Because if you think about it, before the United States went into lockdown, many businesses, you know, especially in Chinatown and these ethnic enclaves were already losing business, right? right. I remember being in actually Manhattan, Chinatown, early February, and it was it was quiet. I mean, I'd never seen, yeah. you know, in Chicago, they canceled the, the Lunar New Year parade, and this was before any lockdown or any of that, right? And, you know, I personally know Korean business owners who have their business started dropping at the end of January because, again, this, you know, this news that the virus is coming from China and, you know, we all look the same. And so, you know, everyone's being affected um, by, by people making assumptions about who's running the business and you know their fear around catching the virus if they go eat Chinese food, for example. Right, right. That's crazy. Um, Angela, I'd love to hear from you about you know particularly around um, Asian mothers in the workplace and sort of what are you seeing as it relates to what Song Yun was talking about. I mean, are there particular issues that are impacting moms? beyond sort of the just greater Asian women population at large? Sure, I mean, I think for all moms, you know, regardless of ethnicity, actually, you know, COVID has been devastating because for people who work, I mean, outside of the home um, or who held jobs outside of the home, there's, they're working and they're also taking on additional caretaking duties, right? So we saw there was, you know, the, the number of people, of women who were forced out of the workforce, um, grew by like hundreds of thousands in September of last year. And that had everything to do with schools being closed, right? So they're shouldering a greater uh, domestic load um, on top of already professional responsibilities. So that's, I mean, that's just crushing everyone, you know, ac across the board. Um, but in terms of Asian people, I want to um, talk about, I mean, I just feel like Thank you, Sung Yun, for dropping so much knowledge on us there. Um, I want to pick up on one thing that's important is I don't think that people realize. Um, and you know, thank you, Michelle, for at the beginning with leaning in with your personal experience, because I want to kind of tie back to some of that. Like the profound um, like invisibility of Asian American and Pacific Islanders, which I am, which you know, we sort of get tacked on, you know. Um, so I think that that, that invisibility is, is also like a cultural indifference to us, um, you know, the way that we are not counted in statistics, the way that like, when I'm looking for information, I'm like, where, where would I put myself, right? Like, that's a real thing. Like I do a lot of research and a lot of times my research is to like, try and place myself within the, a context. But um, <clears throat> as Sung Yun was saying, like, I don't think that people realize that, you know, the greatest income disparity in terms of, and, and again, we're like a rich group of 50 countries, but the greatest income disparity exists between, um, you know, among, within Asian Americans. Um, and I think it's very much this, you're either high performing model minority, you know, nerd or you're invisible. Um, and in terms of, 
you know, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, when you are out of the workforce for more than six months or you are unemployed, like you, you begin to not be captured in statistics. So you start to lose track of people even more. So those Asian American service workers, moms or not, like those are, you, you again, start to like fade into the background. Um, and I also want to point out as mothers have been working from home um, and parents have been working from home, a lot of why we're seeing people be so devastated by this is because previously they were able to outsource domestic labor. They were able to outsource caregiving, childcare, and household cleaning, right? So COVID really shut all of that down. Um, and so one, people are being crushed by the heavier domestic load, as I mentioned. Two, who are the people that we were outsourcing that care work to in the first place? They are by and large women of color, right? And a lot of them work outside and, and many, many Asian American women. And they often are paid under the table or outside of a traditional pay structure. So again, we're not even, I don't even think that we are seeing um, the full extent of the impact within the community, right? And most of these people who are providing care to white people's children are mothers themselves, right? So how are they doing this when their job has been taken away? Um, so these are all just other things that I want us to think about, especially in the context of, um, you know, making ourselves visible. And I think one other thing, you know, I'm just, just kind of riffing here what I'm devastated by what Sung Yun said about the idea that people are more concerned about their safety um, than they are necessarily about getting sick. Um, I think about this, you know, myself as a parent, um, you know, one thing that I will also say is that, you know, in terms of representation, like sometimes I feel like we get caught up talking a lot about that, but I think it's worth it in this case to sort of zoom out and talk about that. Like for parents such as myself, um, there's no, you know, popular culture mainstream representation of Asian parenthood, right? You have like a tiger mom stereotype and then that's kind of it, right? And in terms of the sort of parenting that was modeled to us, so many people whose parents came over as immigrants and refugees, their focus in parenting was survival, right? And as you were saying, Michelle, it's very much assimilation is the best that you can hope for. So I think there is a generation of people, um, and I'm generation X, I'm 43 years old, who are like, wait a second, how do I assert my, you know, my identity and my visibility and how do I insist upon that? And how do I insist upon that for my children? Um, and especially for me right now, I can, you know, only speak to my experience, like I'm raising mixed race children. Um, and so there's a lot of one of the things that came up, you know, in the summer of protesting and in the fall, and you know, after Atlanta, I had a, a, a reckoning where I feel like I'm doing that work daily to, you know, instill pride and talk to my children about being Filipina and what's amazing about that. Um, but after the Atlanta shootings, I realized it's like the it's coming from within me that sort of invisibility or a certain amount of internalized, you know, whiteness or um, assimilation that um, talking to my daughter, I mean, who's six, but still, like, we need to talk about these things she had a much better grasp of Black Lives Matter than she did of the concept of, you know, hate against the Asian American community. That like her grandparents who she sees or was seeing, you know, multiple times a week, that they are at risk. Like she had, and I felt a, honestly a tremendous amount of guilt um, that I hadn't done, you know, my job. And I think that there's this, there's this element of negotiating and um, of trying to fit the Asian American experience into the broader context of America, which is, you know, very much defined by black and white. Um, that's the dominant conversation, I think, as it should be in many ways. But now we're seeing like what happens when we don't um, insist upon that and have conversations that are inclusive of those kinds of things. Um, I think I'll stop there for now. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I mean, you, you're, that was very eloquent and I, I feel the same way. And I think what's, I mean, that's some of the challenge that I face, right? Where it's like, well, you know, this person at work said my food was gross, like literally like today, you know, like in today times says that my food is gross. And it's like, still, still we're having this conversation, but, but also like, but you know, like I'm not black, like it's not, you know what I mean? Like in the world of offensive things that can be said to me, like I just let it go, right? And that's part of this, I've just become accustomed to dealing with things like this and not advocating for myself and also feeling guilty about advocating for myself when I feel like 
but I have it relatively good. And, you know, I get paid 89 cents on the dollar and that's better than, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's really challenging to figure out sort of what my place is in this world of advocacy. Um, and, you know, I work at this company that represents women and trying to help women be successful in their career so they don't leave the workforce for more than six months. Like all of these things, it's like, how do you navigate all of this? Um, and so, you know, Esther, I think this is a great time for you to chime in because I think, you know, as we talk about harassment and visibility and all of this, I think, um, you know, Hollaback is doing some interesting things in and around these ideas. Sure. First of all, thank you everyone for sharing your perspective and your story. So, um, and for the full transparency to illustrate the spectrum of the Asian American experience. So I um, immigrated here when I was nine from Hong Kong. So I am, um, so when I hear the number oh, 89 cents to a dollar, it's like, huh? <laughs> this is so um, detached from the world that I know. Um, you know, my mother uh, started doing uh, cashier work and then I think uh, she transitioned over to um, being a home attendant. The majority of my aunts uh, worked in the garment district. Um, so, so reacting to some of these data, it's, uh, it's a lot to pro pro process, but um, I still remember the first time I met someone that was, um, I think a fourth age, first generation Asian American and my mind was blown. <laughs> like, so like the limitation of my understanding, uh, you know, as an Asian American, um, uh, uh, it's it's so different, you know, when we're all encompassing this label. But um, for the work that Hollowback does, the so Hollowback, we've been around for uh, over a decade now. Um, the work that we do started with um, documenting stories regarding uh, street harassment. And then at some point we've evolved into how, what can bystanders do to help with this, um, issue. Uh, so we started um, these trainings for bystander intervention for different types of scenarios. Um, right now we have trainings, um, you know, for workplace and uh, harassment. And in addition, last year at the beginning of the pandemic, because of um, all the anti-Asian harassment that was happening, we reached out to um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice and partnered with them to develop a training for bystander interventions um, against uh, how to stop um, anti-Asian uh, harassment and xenophobic harassment. So within the training, we talk about uh, this idea of the spectrum of disrespect, which I think some of you guys have highlighted, right? Uh, in a particular workplace, uh, I think when we think about harassment, your mind immediately goes to like the worst kind, right? Like sexual harassment or like uh, discrimination. Um, but in the actual spectrum, we actually talk about how the microaggressions and maybe actions like um, talking over your coworkers or like just uh, excluding them from meetings and stuff actually builds that culture where you can lead to that type of more severe form of harassment. So on that note, we talk about what you can do as a bystander. Uh, we call it the five Ds. So uh, the first one is called the STRAC. Um, this is something that like anyone can do. You can get really creative with this in terms of um, if you witness harassment happening, you can do something like cough or like uh, if you're in a physical space, like drop your cup or water bottle and stuff to create a little distractions. Um, and I think if you were in a meeting, uh, one of the classic uh, facilitation technique is to um, ask the person that's being harassed a clarification, a clarifying question on what they're working on. So it kind of takes away the energy away um, uh, from the negative energy away from the person that's being harassed and put like a positive um, energy on, you know, like giving them the space to let them talk about what they're uh, working on. Um, the second D that we use is delegate. So, um, you know, find someone that can help to you deal with the situation like other managers or HR. Uh, the third D is document. So that could be writing a statement of what you witness and try to get as many details as possible. And from there, you can give it to the person that's being harassed and let them decide um, what they wanna do with the, the documentations or someone who you think is more equipped with dealing and uh, managing the situation like a manager or uh, someone in HR. Um, the fourth one is something that uh, everyone can do 
So that's the lay. And that's just checking in with the person to say, hey, are you okay? You know, I saw what happened. Because acknowledging it and making that connection helps reduce uh, some of the trauma. And the last one is um, direct. And uh, you can ask the clarifying questions, right? So if you hear someone making a comment, you know, um, that definitely feels off, you can say, well, what actually do you mean by that? So you're not being really confident, you're being confrontational, but in the sense that you're giving them like a neutral ground for them to self-correct. Um, or also if you hear someone making a stereotypical comment, you could say, you know what, stereotypes that that actually don't belong here. So that, that helps set the boundaries. So um, that's kind of the five Ds that we use for different scenarios. So in the training for um, the anti-Asian, uh, stop anti-Asian hate uh, one, uh, we kind of uh, adjust the bystander intervention to adjust those forms of harassment and the spectrum of this, this, if this respect is a little different, but that's kind of um, kind of the flexibility of the five Ds. It's that it's a tool that, you know, everyone can use um, and uh, it's applicable for different types of um, situations. I love that. That's um, super helpful. I, I, have you, I don't know if you have um, any data around sort of work specific harassment. I, I, have you, has there been an uptick in that? I know we, we all know about, I think the street harassment um, that's been going on, but I don't know if you have any, if you've seen any sort of increases in um, work specific harassment. Um, I don't actually have any data around that, but I do know that the, um, the nature of it has changed and it, it's a little different, right? On Zoom calls, it's much easier now to exclude people from a Zoom call, for example, or, um, you know, talk over them. So I think the nature of it changes. And I think in the, um, some of the conferences that I went to, we're talking about the spectrum of disrespect a little differently to like, adapt it to this virtual environment. That's interesting. Um, if I could add to that, I, I also think that, especially for Asian American women, one of the ways, it's not necessarily harassment, but one of the ways we experience discrimination is how we're stereotyped to what we can do. And so we rarely make beyond like mid-management level in our careers, right? Like very few people are able to really, you know, I mean, I was talking to, um, you know, a director, a chief diversity officer of a, a really large law firm. And she was saying like, you know, like this is an issue. Like we, we have plenty Asian men, Asian American men who become partners and senior partners, but we, we don't see Asian American women. Um, and for the first time they kind of stopped and thought about like, what are we doing culturally systematically that's excluding women? Whereas before, I think it was like, oh, it's their choice, right? Like to your point about like, oh, we're, we make these choices as moms, right? As if that's the only reason why we're not advancing in our career. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's really an openness right now um, from folks to really think about how they're doing things that pigeonhole and stereotype Asian American women, either as the dragon lady or the tiger mom type people. So they cannot you know, be leaders because they're too bossy, right? Or we're all so submissive and docile and can't have an opinion. So how could you possibly lead? Like those are the two predominantly existing stereotypes about us. And, and so that makes it very difficult, you know, so you, you, you're either show up as one or the other and no, no other way, you know, people don't really see you in other forms of leadership. Right. And so I think that's really put a barrier um, in women being able to be more successful and take on more leadership roles in their in their sectors. I mean, I think what I want to pick up on what Sun Young's saying is that, you know, you can show up entirely as yourself and you'll still be seen as one yeah. of those two things. You know, it's like you can, and then, you know, a lot of times you adapt to that to to succeed, right? Or to like fit into a place. Cause you that's, you know, again, that idea of assimilation. Um, but I also want to point out too, like what what picking up when she was saying as well is that, you know, that the pay gap that still exists um, to go back to that a little bit is a, a huge part of that is because of caregiving, right? And that's before, that was before 
the COVID pandemic, right? That, um, you know, people lose long-term, like when women leave, because it's expected that women would take time off to take care of children, right? Not, they're expected to do that in a way that men are not asked to do. Um, you know, and if you have multiple children, even if you return back to work, like you make lower wages um, because you're stepping out of the workforce. You can return, but you never return to the same level of wages or you're sort of sidetracked to move laterally, but not to move up. The other aspect of this is, you know, caregiving extends like beyond mothers to children. Like, you know, I think of us as like, we're sort of, well, I am anyway, the sandwich generation of, you know, in, in the pandemic, I'm taking care of children and I'm also thinking about my parents um, very much who are you now I worry about their safety I worry about their health um, so those parents are divided in that way but women also leave the workforce not just to care for children but to care for family members and elders and once again that that disproportionately falls on women yeah and to add to that I think um, I don't know if y'all have seen but there was a study done that NPR reported on that Asian American families are least likely to return their children back to school for hybrid or in person for fear of discrimination. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I was actually talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know, being a working mom, being Asian American, being women right now, it's like I, I am really starting to feel the weight of it 15 months into this pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. I've I've been harassed in public, actually, in fact, with my six year old with me, she was she was terrified. And so in fact, Angela, to your point, like, so my daughter is half black, half Korean. She thinks it's scarier to be Asian than it is to be black because of what she personally experienced with me, right? Like we, and she's terrified that her dad is not going to come home. So, so she has all these sleep issues and anxiety because of what's playing out in our world right now. Right. Um, and so we've actually, um, try to really shelter her from some of the stuff that's happening in the news because it's really making her anxious. Like her biggest fear is that mommy and daddy are gonna die, right? Like, I mean, that's what they reduce these conversations to because that's how like a six-year-old, five-year-old minds work. And so that combined with, you know, the fact that now she goes, you know, my friend was telling me that the kids in the playground are playing something called a coronavirus tag. Have you guys heard of this? No. Yeah, so third graders, playing at recess, coronavirus tag, where they make the Chinese kids be it. Oh no. She comes home and tells this to her mom, like it's normal, right? Like, you know, and, and, and so it's not like, so the fear of sending our kids back to school isn't just about the bullying and like the making fun of our food kind of thing, but now it's like normalizing, othering and scapegoating Asian Americans. And I've been telling people that like, if you're a parent, if you're involved in a school, if you're an educator, like don't just look out for the bullies that are bullying the Asian kids. You actually need to list, ask your kids questions like, so what are you all talking about, about the pandemic? You know, and like asking them more like holistic questions to kind of get to the point of like, finding out whether your kids are playing coronavirus tag or not, right? Like we would have never known that, right? It, a principal would might have never known that because um, the kid's not crying, they're not fighting. So it's like, oh, it's everyday playground thing, right? So how do we address this in a much more holistic way rather than just going after like the abusers, like the violent and like, you know, the, the things that all of us are like horrified by, like this is really starting to seep into our culture in a much more, um, you know, permanent and big, like in the culture, right? It's not just, oh, the bad people who are being racist. It's like becoming part of the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, and I think, you know, in terms of allyship, which is what, you know, a lot of what this panel is about, um, I think that it's really important. I think one of the questions that, um, you know, non-Asian people, white people, I'll just say, you know, to be, uh, to, to generalize it, is, is exactly what Sung is saying is the questions need to be like, not what is it that we're, we all know what, what should be pathologized. We all know what needs to be called out. But I think, you know, white people need to do some deep asking about what is it that we have normalized? What is it that we have been silent about or that we just accept, right? What is it, um, you know, that, that level? I mean, this, we've seen this happening for years you know, and especially under our past president, but I, you know, like that's year, a year of talking about the virus in a way that then shows up in children. And I think that that's a really important point. We need to be questioning, like it's not just, um, the easy part is identifying what's wrong. And I, I think one, um, 
one other thing about allyship that's really important is it's not like you can just be like, I'm an ally now, right? Like you, you I'm gonna do some research. Like, I think that it's very important. Um, and I think what Esther is talking about kind of draws into this is that allyship is really, it's, it's a relationship. You know, it's a relationship. It's a, it's an action oriented relationship. Um, you need to be in relationship. You need to know the people who are you are trying to stand up for and protect. It's not as much as like stepping in to be, you know what I mean? And inserting yourself. It's a lot of times it's, it's becoming an ally by listening and by, you know, doing some like questioning of yourself. It's a different kind of, um, I don't think that people have a full grasp of, of what that means, of what allyship really looks like in action. Um, I can add to, first of all, Sangha, I'm so sorry that that's, your daughter is going through that in school. That's just horrifying to hear, um, just on top of everything else that's going on. Um, and I think what we try to do with the bystander intervention training is really to, cause the, you know, I talk about the five Ds and then one of them is direct, right? But all the other ones are actually indirect. So, and the idea is like, the more you get used to calling out the small stuff, then it's easier to start calling out the big stuff. And it does, um, I think again, like in the general culture, sometimes you think about, oh, I need to insert myself into this terrible interaction that's happening right now, but, you know, there's other ways to help, like all the indirect ways that I mentioned. And um, as part of the training, we go through actually different scenarios. Um, we give people options and people talk about, uh, you know, what are some of the, the methods that they would choose to intervene. Um, and what I found having done some of the trainings, um, uh, facilitated the trainings, attended some of the trainings is that it's actually very helpful to hear some of the conversations that's happening outside of you know, the options that we provide to people, but in the chat in terms of um, seeing how people think about the situation and perhaps like talking about intervening in a way that you haven't thought about. Um, and we also talk about the intersection of like your identity as well. You know, like if I am, uh, I am an, not if, I am an Asian woman, if another Asian woman is being uh, targeted and attacked, uh, or harass, like if I jump in, it might potentially escalate the situations, right? So like we we talk a lot about, you know, taking, understanding what your identity is, what your privilege is in a particular situation and how to leverage that, you know, in these settings where you can intervene um, in a safe way. Could you give us a couple of examples, Esther, of, I don't know, just how some of these interventions could go? Yeah, one of the ones that we were talking about is like, if you saw um, an Asian American woman um, being spot on uh, in the supermarket, like what would you do, right? Um, so I think some of the options that we provide would be like, you can distract, you can um, put push your cart at, you know, between yourself and uh, the, not sorry, between the harass, the person being har harassed and then the harasser and said, you know, six feet, six feet, I need six feet, right? Um, you can't um, create a distract. Another distraction is supermarket would be a great place for it. Just like fulfill your fantasy of like pulling things off the shelf, right? <laughs> like a actual little, very loud distraction. Um, I think uh, another option we talked about would be delegate. So delegating, I know I mentioned before, you know, uh, in the workplace setting of be going to like your manager HR, I think in this particular place, you can go to like a, a manager of the store or even like store clerk security or uh, asking other bystanders to come and help you. It's like, hey, like this is happening guys. Like, can you take a picture like or stop this, right? Um, and uh, I think, you know, the document, um, but again, if you were to take a video or a picture of what's happening, like, please don't use the content to go viral, you know, give it to the person that's being harassed and let them decide what they want to do with that information. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting as, you know, as one of the people who sort of, who feared more about my personal safety than getting the coronavirus and taking public transportation in New York. You know, I think one of the fears was, oh, look, you know, this guy was like slashed across the face with a box cutter at his subway stop, which is also my subway stop. Um, and nobody helped him, right? So then what do you do, right? So how do you um, also then advocate for yourself, right? I think that's another question, combining sort of this 
the lack of visibility and you're not supposed to make any waves as the Asian woman and you know falling into our own stereotypes. Um, I think that is a particular challenge. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I just am personally asking for myself. Um, like how do you how do you self-advocate when you're facing discrimination or you know, hopefully not acts of violence, but you know, difficult acts against you. Yeah, I mean, I can relate it back to um, a, a particular incidence of uh, getting harassed. I think, right? Um, um, so Young, you were talking about in Chinatown back in February, it was uh, last year was kind of empty. So um, me and my friends decided to go support the Asian American business, the Chinatowns. <laughs> um, and I remember just feeling really good. It's like, you know what, we're, we're putting our money into good use. Like, um, and um, on the way back to the train stations, uh, you know, someone was like, keep your China virus away from me. It's like, are you serious? Like, I'm on canal. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I happen to be Chinese American, the friend that I was with was Korean American, so I'm sure like the way she experienced it is also completely different than how I experienced it, right? Um, so that was right before a board meeting with Hella back. Um, and I actually thought about whether or not I wanted to share the story, which is weird, right? Because what we do is like shoot harassment, but what you were saying about that invisibility, I think in my mind, I was like, Ooh, am I taking up too much space? <laughs> So um, what I ended up doing was calling, uh, uh, this is how like allyship actually helped me, uh, which was I called a member on the board that I trusted who was a woman of color. And I just kind of went through this with her. It's like, hey, you know what? Like, I feel like I should be sharing this, but there's something, I don't know. Like, she's like, what are you talking about? Like, this is what we do. You definitely should be sharing this. So with her role as an ally kind of helped me overcome that invisibility um, that was ingrained in me and that worry that, you know, about taking up too much space and, and, and sharing that story. Um, and that actually kind of led to additional conversations about like, oh, wow, yes, this is happening. Yes, like we should need to, you know, adopt the training to address this. And um, so I'm not going to claim responsibility for, you know, <laughs> implementing the training uh, because it took like the entire team to do it. But, you know, I, I'm kind of glad I had that allyship in a fellow board member to to say, yes, like get me out of my my space and and, and be able to kind of share something that no one else on the board at that time would have experienced. I, I think it's really important, you know, this idea of, you know, how do you self advocate? I think um, we're just we've we've been so conditioned to think of ourselves first and to think individually which um is necessary in some situations but i think in in the workforce um we and in general i just think we need to collective working collectively is i think the most effective way to get things done in a lot of ways um you know it's been a few years since i worked in an office and like i actually hope to never go back to one i like working on my own but before i worked at a newspaper i worked at an all weekly in seattle um and the paper had run a story uh that was criticizing a, a, a leave policy and um there were two of us on staff who were mothers and you know we had a private thing that was like we we didn't have a, a paid leave policy for mothers, right? There was nothing, there was nothing that the company had, but here we were, but here we were publishing this thing. And so it became a thing where we were like, let's, we talked about this together. We brought it to someone in management who we felt was first most receptive, right? And I think that's the thing is like, it's, it's too much to be asked to take on institutional racism, like on your own, right? Like, and the thing is also, it's like, and it's too much to ask people of color to do that. It's too much to ask Asian women to do that. I mean, I think within a workforce, and I know with Second Shift, a lot of it is like flexible workspace, right? But like, there's still, um, so you're, you're not always like in a, in a place full time, but I still think there's, there should be solidarity among workers, you know, like the labor movement has been very, you know, disabled by government that's been like actively done right like they don't want workers to experience solidarity with each other. We don't want people to experience solidarity with each other, but I think that's because it's very, very powerful. And I think that's actually what we need to be doing, you know, I think one of the most radical things that like, um, you know, like a white ally can do in the workplace, a woman or a man is to share their salary right with someone else so that you at least know when you go into a negotiation like what 
you know, that kind of transparency, we're, we're taught to like protect, protect, protect ourselves, right? But when really like, what does that get us? Um, you know, I think that there, we have to talk about the benefits um, for trading some personal comfort for, um, you know, collective comfort to make things better for everyone. Yeah. Michelle, can I interject really quickly? Being mindful of time, uh, I just wanted to tell people if they have Q&A questions to please put them out there so that we can address any questions from the audience as this conversation continues and I'll bring them up as they come in. So if anyone has topics they wanna to discuss or a personal story or advice that they wanna ask, please, uh, this is the time to put it out there. Okay, great. I mean, I think um, Esther and Angela, this, just this idea of the allyship and sort of seeing it at work, these are such great stories. Um, I, do you, does anyone on the panel have other thoughts or suggestions on ways that we can, um, things that people can do, um, you know, sort of how do we work ourselves out of some of these issues? What are sort of proactive things that either people of color or non-people of color um, can do to, to sort of advance our causes? I, th I think one thing that, um, especially as Asian Americans, we need to do more of is to really um, speak up against the model minority myth, right? I mean, I know many of us internalize that because it's benefited us and we've, you know, it's sort of um, this idea of assimilation and being as close to whiteness as possible because that gives us the most advantage has really, um, you know, while we think of it as like an individual, like we're li living out our American dream and accomplishing our goals, like, I think we need to have a more collective approach that in us doing that, we're actually hurting other people, right? That like there's a direct link that when we continue to present, especially as East Asians, when we continue to present ourselves as the model minority, as the overachieving, the high achieving people, it invisibilizes people who are then stereotyped as, you know, who don't fit that stereotype. Right. So I think that 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 to me is like a big reckoning that we need to do in the Asian American community, especially as East Asian Americans. Um, and then I think it's really about unpacking why the model minority myth is a myth and how that is a tool to keep, you know, literally it was a term invented by a white sociologist to keep Japanese people pitted against black people. I mean, that's literally what this was, right? Like there was no scientific evidence. I mean, th there was nothing about it that was really to serve us, right? And we need to start unpacking that and dismantling that within our community so that we can see ourselves as part of the community of color. And, you know, to your point, yeah, like, you know, I think a lot of Asian Americans either have one or two reactions, right? Like we act like white folks sometimes when we, especially when it comes to like black lives matter like oh we relatively we're safer and we're better off and so let's support black people and we show up as allies rather than as um you know people fighting in solidarity for collective liberation right and i think when you put it into that framework i find myself having more confidence and self-interest in fighting for collective liberation than out of guilt and shame supporting another cause, right? And, and I think there's something really powerful about that understanding how um, as people of color, what our experience and our journeys have been, they're not the same, but what, how does that add to what we need to fight for together, right? Because at some point or another, somebody's always being scapegoated and blamed for what's happening. And, you know, like now, I, I don't know if you've seen, but what I've heard is that now, like South Asians are being attacked on the streets because of all this news coming out of India about the coronavirus. And now people think all Indians have coronavirus, right? Like it's, it's, never, it's never about a particularity, right? It's always about the mindset and we need to find a way to work together to collectively change that mindset and, and not tolerate that, right? And so I think for me, you know, it is really, especially as both women, we, when we grow up as girls, you know, we're told, right? Like, 
we're told not to take up space. We're told that, you know, boys hate you because they like stupid nonsense like that, right? Like we are, we are conditioned to adapt and tolerate. And I think we have this very little, we have very little comfort level with sticking out like as Asian Americans and as women to say like, we actually, there are things that we demand and we want differently in our, in our world and for ourselves. And I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you become and that it adds to the collective struggle that we're all fighting for. That was very well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Angela or Esther, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think about it at like two levels at the individual level, um, you know, educating yourself, right? So, uh, and, and not relying on other groups to educate for you. So uh, it, the particular example I can think about is last year, I started doing uh, work with indig indigenous groups. So I'm coming into concept that or I haven't heard of before, or like seven generations or two spirits where I'm familiar with them. Maybe I don't understand the deep dive. Like there's so many resources out there. Like I don't need to lean on, you know, someone from the group to educate me. I can find that on my own. Um, I would also say maybe amplify the work that's being done right now. So I know second shift, you guys had a crash course on being an ally to black folks with one of your members, um, Caitlin Wilson, um, that you put together last year. And like, I went through the, the video, it was very educational in terms of kind of going through, you know, what does it mean to be alive? Should, like really breaking it down. So I would recommend that. Um, uh, I'm plugging an Instagram that I don't have any affiliation to, but uh, it's called Inclusive Care Project. And they just do have a lot of infographics um, related to queer and BIPOC uh, advocacy. It's on the smaller end. And I think they built a tool for health professionals, but I found it to be very um, inf more informative. So at the individual resources, the, all these things you can use to educate yourself. Um, and then organ organizationally speaking, so I'm on a board right now um, that we decided at the very beginning that we are going to incorporate DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion into every single decision that we make, right? So that goes into like, we're going to design a program, we're going to plan events, uh, we're going to have a social media post and email that goes out, like everything that we put out, we agree as the board to put that lens on. And um, it's liberating <laughs> to be but like, we don't need to like advocate for it, like everyone is on the same page about it. So I think if you're um, able to kind of influence at that organizational lo no level, it's not aspirational. You can like incorporate it into your daily, every decision that you make. So, um, so make it happen <laughs> if you have um, access to that. So that's great, Esther. Yeah, I just, you're, you're totally right. It's once you set the intention at that level, it just becomes part of every decision that you make. So that's great advice. Could you repeat the Instagram handle again? Yeah, it's called Inclusive Care Project. Great, thank you. Michelle, can I interject with a question? And I actually wanted to bring this back to something that Angela had said earlier because uh, talking about Black Lives Matter and there's so much in the news with like critical race theory and how we're educating children and diversity and inclusion practices on hiring and the idea of identity and, and how that works together with excluding certain groups when the identity, you know, when if race is broken down into black and white. And, um, and it's tricky in this conversation when it should be allies again fighting for inclusion. So somebody asked, um, you mentioned your child's understanding of Black Lives Matter is much clearer of your understanding of AAPI harassment, hate, and the overall fight for AAPI liberation. I see this in my friends too. Why is this the case and how can we as AAPI allies make sure our voices are ringing just as loud as they were last summer for the BLM movement? And just to bring it back to you know an anecdote I heard recently, Esther, your organization actually went into my son's school and taught them allyship training. And I thought that was just like an unbelievable resource, especially, you know, around this month and AAPI awareness. And a friend's child came home. They're actually South um, Asian, they're Indian family and they're first generation. 
and the kid came home and said, am I, am I white? Because if I'm not black, then I must be white. And the, com and it, it completely, like you said, made it, made them disappear into a, a narrative that wasn't true to them. And uh, I just, I see this sort of happening in some workplace cultures and the way people are recruiting and making sure that that's part of this dialogue that's happening right now where you can stand up as an ally, but in an inclusive lens. Um, I just think, I wanna go back to what Sung Yun said, which I think is really like, which is something that I have heard and, and kind of know, but like when, when you hear someone say it with such clarity, it's like, it's like a bell ringing in my head, which is that like, we don't do these things, um, we should be doing these things out of a collective, to in a fight for collective liberation, right? Like whatever individual win any community gets is like, it's nothing. It doesn't really mean anything if um, if we're not bringing everyone along. So I think that that's a very like, you know, for me, I, and to go back to the question, like, yeah, like that was a very, like it was a moment for me where I was like, like what, what am I doing, right? And I think that it has caused me to go into myself and think about like how, I take for granted like the, the situation that I'm in, you know, I've stayed quiet on these things. Like I thought we were, I mean, I talked to my kids about everything, but I was like, clearly like I haven't done enough here. Um, and rather than feeling like shame or guilt about that, I know I confess to feeling really guilty, but now I've been like, okay, like let's, let's double down. Like, let's talk about things, you know? And I, you know, her father is like, was like, I need to talk to her specifically about whiteness too. Like that's also part of the conversation that needs to happen. Um, but in terms of that question, in terms of like, how do we make sure that like our voices are ringing as loud as they were last summer? Like, I really think actually what it means is like, well, I don't, I'll take quiet conversation every day about this stuff rather than like showing up in a big moment and yelling about it. Like, I think this is really like, this is again, like allyship, it's, it's actually, it's day-to-day -day work. Um, it's, you know, checking in in the way that some young was talking about, like what's going on at school? Like what are kids talking about? Um, it is great and it's wonderful and powerful, especially when we're also isolated to be able to show up with everyone and to yell and scream, we need that too. But actually what we really need are like daily conversations that are like true to our values and then insisting and insisting on those things. Okay, I've got another question. Um, as an Asian person who supports Black Lives Matter, it's been very hard to reckon with the fact that a lot of the hate crime perpetrators are from black and brown communities and get their or, and or even get their support against AAPI hate. How do we approach this uncomfortable subject with folks in this community? It doesn't mean I don't support Black Lives Matter, but it's really controversial to even bring it up. And I think we should recognize what's happening. So I, I just want to say that um, it is not true that Black folks are not in support of Asian American community. Like, I, I think, um, I, I, and maybe like, I'm just, like much more aware of it and see it more because I am in like the advocacy and activist space, but literally, I mean, even before this, it became a thing like, you know, hashtag or whatever, like last spring when we started seeing, you know, Trump saying these crazy things, I shouldn't say that, you know, these ridiculous things about, you know, scapegoating Asian Americans, um, you know, I had black women leaders reach out and say like, how are you and your staff doing? Like, what can we do, right? And so, Again, to somebody, I think it was Angela you raised, like it's about relationships, right? Like who are you in relationship with? And it's not enough that like you showed up to one Black Lives Matter rally and now you're upset that like black people aren't showing up to our rallies or whatever, right? Like it has to go deeper than that. And really fundamentally at like at the core, like I see black, especially black women really coming out in support for Asian Americans. Like there is no question about that in my mind, in terms of the activists and the advocacy community that are doing this work. I mean, literally when, you know, the, the shootings happened in Atlanta, I had black women open doors for me to have a meeting with the White House to explain to them why this is an intersectional race and gender issue and they need to get that right, right? It was black women who did that. Right. So so I just I, I think it's we need to be careful about how wh where we see and not see. And if and if you don't have black folk who are supportive, then I there there are black folk who are supportive. So I just want to put that out there first and foremost. And secondly, on the issue of like many of them, many of the attackers being black, that's actually not um, 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 
that those are the visible ones that we see in the news and media but the me the media is also very biased about who they portray as criminals so i just want to be very careful again about how we talk about and stereotyping it's easiest to say oh it's the young black men that are doing this right um in fact i think if you look at the stop api hate their crime um their their uh collection of incidences they actually say it's pretty spread out, right? Like it's not predominantly black folk that are attacking our communities. But if you think about like in this pandemic, as the the economic, um, you know, the economic is, the, the economy is getting worse and, you know, kids are out of school. I mean, who are the one, like it's, it's, who are the people that are sort of left at home to fend for themselves, right? Like it's, it's the people who are, you know, kids raised by single moms who have no choice but to be go be the essential worker at your grocery store right like our society has created the systemic oppression of black and brown people where then they become the scapegoats again of all the crimes and they become blamed for all of these things right like and so i i want us to have a much more nuanced understanding of what's going on and it is not believe me it is not it is not it, it's always in the news when black people do it but it is not black people that are attacking Asian Americans. It's young kids. You know, the people that harass me are young, young white males or old white men, right? Like in my experience, right? And so I think we need to, um, you know, again, like take the whole socioeconomic political context into understanding as to like, who has the privilege of being home and playing on their Nintendo all day? Right. Who are the kids are most likely to walk around the streets and be bored and, you know, say a thing or two because they heard it on the news or something. Right. Like, so I think we just need to be a bit nuanced in how we approach, um, especially this issue of like Asians and blacks. Right. Like, I think it is, um, you know, it is it, it is it's not just only what you experience as an individual, it is a collective thing and we need to address that as a whole, right? That white people are more likely to be let, like police are more likely to release them or not arrest them than black people are. Like that's a fact in this country. And so I think we need to, we need to seek more understanding about how we understand what's going on and how we address it. Um, and really, you know, I was on a call with the New York um, state's attorney um, a black woman, she's amazing. And, you know, just her call to action for all, everybody in New York City. And, you know, I, I just think that we need to focus on the folks that are speaking up and supporting. And, you know, it, 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 would, it goes the other way too. Like, it would be very easy to, for black folks to be like, oh, Asians are totally silent on black lives. Like, even though many of us show up in droves to support them. So I think we just need to find folks who want to work on you know, collectively work on our issues together rather than focusing on when you showed up and when they didn't. Um, I, I don't think that's a constructive to constructive way to move forward. I think that's a fantastic answer. And as with most things, when you take things and you put it in context and have a conversation about it, it's very it's much easier than when you read headlines and you allow the filtration system of a media narrative to really run the dialogue instead of having a conversation and taking a step back and having conversations like this where we can learn from each other, get actual data and statistics, hear people's stories and how it affects them personally in different in, in different areas of their life, and then come at things with empathy and come at things from a place of understanding and and being an upstander and a bystander and and being able to be a uh, not be a bystander. So uh, on that note, we're over two o'clock. So we're going to let people go. I know you all, I really want to thank you so much for your time, for giving us the, the opportunity to hear your perspectives. Michelle, you killed it. You were so great. And I'm so proud of you. Angela, Esther, Sinyoung, thank you for being here. I'm going to make sure that your organizations are, and and Angela, your podcast and your and your book and everything that you guys are doing is very clear and visible on our blog so that people can donate because I know that that's really important to being able to do some of the policy and cultural work that you're able to do, and especially in this moment. Um, and that's, you know, a very active uh, way to 
to support an organization is showing your support of the work that they do. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and, and, your, and your thoughts and your vulnerability. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for that invite. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. you so All right, much. everybody. Bye. Uh, goodbye.